Happy New Year's to you all. Um, welcome to this session of Leto Lectures as we begin our new series, The First 100 Days, for several months looking at various aspects of the incoming Biden presidential administration. You may be watching this a little later in the month than you have in our previous lectures provided via videotape. Um, last year, because as December was approaching January, it began to dawn on me that given the fact that President Trump had not yet conceded the race, we were going to probably have an opportunity to examine a couple of things. Number one, because in modern times, candidates who lost very close races like Al Gore in 2000 had conceded to their opponent by that date in December. Last year that date was December the 14th where the electors meet in the various states, electoral votes are cast, and for all practical purposes the election is over. Come December 14th of 2020, not only had President Trump not conceded, he still very much was asserting to his followers, to members of Congress, that he fully expected to somehow come out as the winner of the race and be inaugurated on January the 20th, 2021. So I thought, number one, it was important that we wait to see what happened on January 6th, when Congress met in a joint session to finish the presidential election cycle in an event that has been throughout our history a mechanized pro forma event. We had some suspicions that maybe this time around on January the 6th, things might be different. In addition, if you recall way back last year when we were approaching election day, the Democrats had a couple of ambitions. Number one, of course, was to see their nominee, Joe Biden, win the presidency. But equally as important for Joe Biden's platform for his agenda was Democrats taking complete control of Congress, meaning, number one, keeping control of the House and in their wildest dreams, expanding their House majority, but secondly, winning control of the Senate as well. So approaching Election Day, we recognize that if in fact Joe Biden won the presidency, the Democrats would have to win a net of three Senate seats, creating at the barest minimum a 50-50 tie in the distribution of seats in the Senate between Republicans and, and Democrats. And we know that on election day, November 3rd, the Democrats woefully underperformed in achieving this goal of winning control of the Senate. True, in Arizona, Mark Kelly, a Democrat, defeated um, 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 his Republican opponent, flipping that seat for Democrats. And in Colorado, a Democrat, John Hickenlooper, um, defeated the incumbent Cory Gardner but at the same time in Alabama, um, um, Tommy Tuberville, the former head football coach at Auburn University, defeated the Democrat Doug Jones, who had won a special election to fill the remainder of Jeff Sessions, 
you remember him, um, unexpired term. So at this point, the Democrats had only won a net of one seat and other races that they were very optimistic about turned it out to be losers. Tom Tillis in North Carolina, a Republican, keeping control of his seat. Susan Collins in Maine, very easily winning re-election. Joni Ernst, a supposedly endangered Republican senator from Iowa, winning her race as well. And Steve Daines, Montanan, running against Montana's then incumbent Democratic governor, rather easily won his race as well. So by virtue of the voting on election day in races that were called, the Democrats had won a net of only one seat. But there was a wrinkle. And that wrinkle, of course, was Georgia, a state, I believe, along with Louisiana, that requires in a general election for statewide offices, a candidate, in order to be victorious, having to win an outright majority of all the votes cast. So on election day in, in Georgia, two Senate seats were on the ballot. One, the Senate seat held by Republican David Perdue was one of these group two, class two Senate seats that was regularly up for election in 2020. Perdue had won his seat six years before in 2014. The second seat, however, was a special election to fill the remainder of the term of Republican Senator Johnny Isaacson, who in 2019 had retired for health reasons. So back in 2019, the now um, uh, denigrated Republican governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, someone who was elected Georgia's governor largely because President Trump tweeted significant support to Kemp in Georgia's gubernatorial Republican primary in 2018. Brian Kemp nominated Kelly Loeffler to fill out the remainder of Isaacson's seat, even though the president preferred that Kemp appoint Doug Collins, a Republican member of the House who had been a very strong defender of, of the president. So in this special election, more than a dozen candidates entered the race. Collins entered to face Kelly Loeffler. And when all the votes were counted there, no one received close to a majority of the votes. And the top two finishers, the Democratic nominee, um, Reverend Raphael Warnock, the pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, where of course um, at one time Martin Luther King had preached, ended up making his way to a runoff election against Kelly Loeffler, who finished second beating back the challenge of Doug Collins. In the more traditional Democratic race, um, um, Sonny, uh, David Perdue was facing off against 33-year-old John Ossoff, a journalist, an investigative journalist, um, who was the Democratic nominee. Um, very late on election night, and even in the days that followed, as Georgia's race was a very close one at the presidential level, it became a race where Purdue could not secure 50% plus one of the votes cast in his race. He won somewhere around 49% of the vote. So according to Georgia law, and only Georgia law in, in 2020, 
Both of these races would have to be settled in a runoff, which was held on January the 5th. If, and this was a big if, the odds certainly didn't seem to favor what eventually occurred, the Democrats won both of these runoff seats. They would win 50 seats in the Senate, matching the 50 seats that the Republicans held, meaning that once Joe Biden became president, Vice President Kamala Harris, as the, quote, president of the Senate, would essentially give Democrats a 51st vote in the event any matter came to a 50-50 tie vote, something that we saw occur way back in, in 2001 when there was similarly a 50-50 tie in, in the Senate. So today is January the 8th. We know, of course, that defying the odds, Democrats did in fact win both of those Senate races, largely because Unlike the past, Georgia has a history with these senatorial runoffs. Traditionally, turnout is very low in a runoff that takes place approximately two weeks, two months rather, after a general um, election. In some cases, maybe 50% of the number that turned out in November turn out to vote in these very unusual runoffs. These, of course, are factors that usually have contributed to Republican victories in what heretofore has been a reliably um, Republican state of Georgia. This time around, for a number of reasons that we're going to get into a little later, later in this lecture, the turnout was very high in those parts of Georgia that Joe Biden won in winning the entire state of Georgia uh, back in November, turnout was more than 90% of the number that turned out in that very high turnout election on November the 3rd, while turnout in those parts of Georgia, those precincts in Georgia that President Trump won was 80% and below. A much more energized Democratic turnout than a Republican turnout improbably delivered these two seats to the Democrats. Um, Raphael Warnock, the first African-American elected to hold a Senate seat in the state of Georgia, and John Ossoff, the grandson of Jewish immigrants to the United States, 33 years old, uh, became the first American Jew to win a Senate seat in the state of Georgia. At 33 years old, John Ossoff will be the youngest member of the United States Senate and, in fact, the youngest person to occupy a Senate seat since way back almost 50 years ago in 1973 when 30-year-old Joe Biden um, took his seat in the Senate representing the state of Delaware. So for a number of reasons, I chose to film this after we knew probably who won in Georgia and which party was going to control the Senate. And after, almost as a civics lesson, I thought at the time, we would be able to see this state-by-state state count 
of the electoral vote presented to a joint session of Congress. What I did not expect, of course, were the events that took place as this count was beginning to be held. And that, of course, was the um, acts of insurrection, acts of sedition, acts of domestic terrorism that saw a violent mob storm and underprotected, I think most would agree, Capitol building to create uh, these, again, this is an overused word, the surreal scenes of people walking through Statuary Hall, um, penetrating into the Senate chamber, some intruder sitting at the seat where just minutes earlier, Vice President Pence had sat in as the Senate was involved in their deliberations. And of course, people bursting into the offices of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, taking pictures with um, various statues in the rotunda of the Capitol. And of course, um, tear gas and shots being fired and heard taking place in the United States Capitol. The, the seat of one of the three co-equal branches of our government. Those scenes were scenes that, as Americans, we've seen before, but in other countries. You know, Cuba, January 1st, 1959, Castro revolutionaries storming um, the palace where the Cuban dictator, Fulgencio Batista, lived and his ministers were meeting. Other countries, banana republics, where coups were the norm as power was not peaceably transferred after supposedly um, fair elections. And in reality, events that occurred when the United States offered to send in support to stabilize what looked to be some revolution um, about to take place. Why did all this happen? We'll present some facts and, and maybe a bit of, of opinions as to why this occurred. But early this morning, I, I read that there has now been a fifth death directly associated with that storming of the American Capitol by Americans, more deaths, I don't know what type of comparison this is, than occurred when the American consulate in Benghazi, Libya, a hostile country, um, took place in 2012. Four Americans we know were killed in Benghazi. Five Americans lost their lives in the fight to defend the United States Capitol. More about that in, in a bit, but to those of us who have followed the American process, many of you for a much longer time than I have, um, for those of us who have come to love and, and cherish, not to be corny, um, our Constitution and the way we've seen our country evolve over 240 years. For all of us, of course, familiar with the fact that way back in 1801, after our second president, John Adams, was defeated in the election of 1800 by his rival, Thomas Jefferson, Adams left the White House and we saw for the first of 44 more times the peaceful transfer of power, really more than that actually, um, when a president has either been termed out of office or in a number of cases 
where a one-term president was defeated seeking a, a second term. So on, on many levels, a, a, a shocking, um, embarrassing, distasteful event. Why did it happen? It happened, of course, because of the results after all the votes had been counted in November's presidential election. We saw, of course, in that race, Joe Biden defeat President Trump by a margin of 306 to 232. Not a particularly close election. This was the margin that Donald Trump defeated Hillary Clinton by exactly in 2016. The President Trump at the time had referred to this margin as a landslide, but we've seen much closer elections in 1976, in 2000, in 2004 um, as examples. Now, to step back a bit, we remember, of course, that the system we used to elect our president, the Electoral College, was created in Article II of the Constitution to elect just one individual, the, the President of the United States, and I guess by implication, uh, the Vice President as well. We know that the Constitution created a system whereby states would receive a certain number of electoral votes largely based on that state's population to determine how many electoral votes a state has. You merely need to add together the number of seats a state has in the House of Representatives, which is based on population, and as we're going to see later this year, can change based on the results of the census, which occurs every 10 years. We're going to see, for instance, Florida get two more seats in the House of Representatives because our population in Florida has written, risen significantly. Texas has had even more population growth. They're going to end up in all probability with three more seats in the House. Colorado is going to get another. Um, Wyoming, uh, Montana is probably going to get another. Um, North Carolina may, and we're going to see some states that have lost significant population lose seats in the House. New York, Pennsylvania, um, Illinois, Minnesota, maybe Iowa or Ohio as well. So you take the number of seats a state has in the House and you add to that number two the number of seats that every state has in the Senate. Now, we know that there are 435 seats in the House. That has been a fixed number since 1911. We know that there are 100 seats in the Senate. 435 plus 100 brings us to 535. And since 1961, by way of constitutional amendment, we know that the District of Columbia, not having voting members in Congress yet, because DC is not a state yet, nonetheless has the same number of electoral votes in a presidential election as the smallest populated states in the country do, that number being three. So, 538 total electoral votes are up for grabs in any recent modern American presidential election. The Constitution, when it was ratified in, in 1789, didn't um, state the numbers of, of electoral votes, but instead had a much more simple rule. In order to be elected president, a candidate has to win a majority of whatever that total might be, meaning, of course, that for a very long time, 270, the barest majority of 538, has been the magic number for a candidate to be elected president. Now, 
We know, of course, that the Constitution has been recognized as a document that created a federal system of government, meaning that the national government created in the Constitution shares power with the individual states and their governors and their legislatures and their courts. That is one of the great beauties of our Constitution. Tremendous powers that are left alone to the states. As one example of this federal system, the Constitution then gives, after laying out this electoral college system, as they called it, to the states the authority to, number one, determine how their electoral votes are going to be won as a result of the vote being counted state by state by state. We know that except for Nebraska and Maine, every other state in D.C. awards them winner take all. But secondly, the Constitution gives to every state the ability to make the rules regarding how their elections are going to be conducted. Each state has a tremendous amount of autonomy in determining how their voters are going to be able to vote. For our purposes, of course, we recognize that for a very long time, prior to 2020, states like Florida and Texas and Arizona and Ohio legislatively have created lots of opportunities for their citizens to, number one, either vote early, lots of early voting days where you get up you go to a library or your precinct and you cast your vote before election day, the Tuesday following the first Monday in November. On top of that, these states have long permitted their residents to cast their votes by mail. So simple. Any Floridian knows and any Floridian cannot claim it's hard to vote in Florida because you check a box when you send in your ballot that you want to continue to be sent mail-in ballots and it's as easy as filling out a ballot, sealing it, signing it, and dropping it in the mail. Many states make it easy to acquire something slightly different than a mail-in ballot really the same though, an absentee ballot. Previously, and in some states still today, you have to state a reason why you're not going to be present on election day to vote in person. But many other states have permitted so-called no excuse absentee ballots to be requested so that voters again essentially can vote by mail. And again, is it legal? Yes, because state by state by state by state, legislatures in bills signed into law by governors, in some cases found constitutional by state courts, have determined that's how they want to run their races. So as the election year of 2020 started a year ago, we were again looking at how different states were in how citizens could cast their vote, only of course to have COVID-19 and the resultant um, shock and, and um, quarantining initially caused by this coronavirus to cause states to begin to reconsider their election laws. Um, in reality, March the 17th, the day in which Florida and two other states held their primaries, a non-competitive one for the Republicans, President Trump 
was essentially, you know, on his way to being renominated by the Republicans. But in what was a more competitive field of Democrats, the last really scheduled, held um, set of primaries took place on St. Patrick's Day, March the 17th. Following that, as COVID became um, more ubiquitous throughout the country, state legislatures began canceling, postponing, rescheduling their primaries later in the year, late spring and even in early summer. And in states that had not previously permitted easy mail-in voting, in particular, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, each of these states with Republican-controlled legislatures and Democratic governors established for the first time early mail-in voting opportunities for their citizens. Again, Florida and Georgia and Arizona and Ohio and Texas have been doing mail-in voting for a long time. Um, we believe that we did it very well, but many states would have to suddenly, in the heat of the emergency of COVID, establish these early voting systems and implement them very rapidly on this emergency type basis. So we made our way to election day and looking back, of course, we probably should have realized what was going to occur on the evening of November 3rd and then through the days that followed. States like Georgia, who's had mail-in voting for a while, but also Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, in their early voting laws mandated that mail-in votes and absentee votes cannot be counted, in the case of Georgia, until after the polls close on election day. So however many number of mail-in ballots were going to be cast would only really begin to be counted after the polls closed on November the 3rd, election day. In Florida, in Ohio, in Texas, in, in Arizona, voting officials were permitted to open, tabulate, pre-count these mail-in votes and these absentee votes so that they would be ready to be released as soon as the polls closed in those states. So sitting back on election night, one of my favorite nights every four years, make some popcorn, you know, pour a scotch and, and watch the election results come in. As the polls closed in states like Florida and Texas and Ohio, the first votes to be reported were the mail-in votes. And, and what we know now is that Americans took tremendous advantage of the opportunities to um, vote by mail, but it was different from party to party, candidate to candidate. Overall, nationwide, 27% of votes cast in our country were cast live and in person on election day. This was something that way back since the late spring and early summer, as states were creating mail-in voting opportunities, easier ways to vote in many ways. If you looked at it objectively, mail-in voting would probably favor a Democratic candidate rather than a Republican candidate. President Trump began assaulting mail-in voting as ripe 
for fraud, for fake voting, as a way to rig or, or steal an election. The Democrats, on the other hand, you know, were advertising a website, make a plan to vote, go onto this website, type in your state and your county, and we'll tell you how you can get a vote, a ballot to vote early or to go and, and, and vote at a precinct early. So it's no surprise that, again, on election day, 27% of all the votes were cast live and in person. Another 27% of the votes were cast by people voting in person early, before November the 3rd, before election day. I voted, taking advantage of Florida's early voting laws. But 46% of everyone that voted on election day, or in the election actually, voted either by mail or by absentee ballot. Almost half the vote was cast via the mails. Now we break down between President Trump and, and Joe Biden and see that 37% of President Trump's votes nationwide were cast by people who went and voted on election day, like he urged them to do. Another 30% of his vote um, were garnered by those going and voting early in person at their precinct, 32% of the Trump vote coming by either absentee or mail-in voting. I suspect very heavily in Florida and in Texas and Ohio and, and in Arizona. The Biden vote was quite different. Only 17% of the votes, votes that Joe Biden won were cast by people voting live and in person on November the 3rd. 17% compared again to the 37% of Trump voters who cast their votes on November the 3rd. 24% of the Biden vote came by those voting early, live in person, but early before November the 3rd and 58%, almost three out of every five ballots um, that Biden won were cast by mail via absentee voting. Almost twice the amount of votes won by President Trump, by mail or by absentee. So back to election night, in Florida, in Texas, and Ohio, the first votes that were reported were the pre-counted uh, mail-in and absentee votes, and we saw Biden's numbers shoot up. Oh my God, was Biden gonna win Florida? He was leading for a while in Texas. Was Texas gonna turn blue? You know, Democrats still delusionally believe that's going to happen, and in Ohio, is. Biden going to win Ohio, this very determinative state in presidential elections. And of course, what happened was that as the night wore on and the same day voting numbers began to come in, President Trump overtook Biden. And in reality, you know, just after midnight, perhaps on November the 4th, the president had won Florida, he'd won Ohio, he'd won Texas, winning Florida by a larger margin than he did in 2016, and in fact, winning Florida by a larger margin than Barack Obama had won the Sunshine State in either 2008 and in 2012. Now, in places where the absentee and mail-in votes could not be opened and not be counted until the polls closed, we saw the opposite phenomenon occur. We saw in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, and in Georgia in particular, same-day votes being the first votes reported, meaning that President Trump's vote totals surged through election night, after midnight, in some cases like in Pennsylvania, the president having a more 
than 100, 200,000 vote lead over Joe Biden. But over the election eve night, the day following and the day after that, as all of these mail-in votes were open, as states permitted ballots that were mailed in postmarked on or before election day to be counted several days after election day, we saw what again, the effect of Biden's getting about 60% of his votes via mail-in or absentee methods show his numbers rising and eventually overtaking President Trump, not only in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, reconstructing the blue wall. But by the time all the votes were counted, Biden had turned two red states, Georgia and Arizona, blue by winning them narrowly. Now, the results again, 306 to 232 electoral votes. Uh, in Pennsylvania, Biden defeated the president by 80,000 votes. Four years before, President Trump had won the Keystone State by 44,000 votes. In Michigan, Biden defeated President Trump by about 150,000 votes, whereas four years before, the president had won um, Michigan by 10,000 votes. In Wisconsin, Biden won by 20,000, and again, um, President Trump, four years ago, had won Wisconsin by about 23,000 votes. Um, the president won the close state of Nevada, but again won Georgia and Arizona, states that President Trump had won in 2016 by narrow margins, about 12,000 votes in Georgia and by about 11,000 um, votes in, in Arizona. Um, looking at the blue wall states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, four years ago, President Trump won those three states by a combined 77,000 votes. This time around, largely because of Biden's margin in Michigan, he won these three states by a combined 230,000 votes. So by the Saturday following, um, election day, the election had been called for Joe Biden. Um, the the um, president and his lawyers began making inquiries regarding how the votes collected and, and how they were tabulated. And we began to see a rather organized um, certainly public assault on the nature of how these votes were um, collected. I've lost my place in my notes, if you can see. Let me, too many notes. Let me find my way um, back to them. Okay. <clears throat> so from November the 3rd until last night, um, President Trump did not acknowledge, as he did last night, that there is going to be a new administration. In other words, he did not concede. So, notwithstanding, again, the fact that this was not a particularly close final total. Now, when we voted on Election Day, we voted for the name of a candidate, Biden, Trump, maybe there was a socialist or a green or a libertarian or someone else who you voted for. But in reality, we were voting in each state for a slate of electors, individuals who had previously been selected by each party in each state, a slate of electors, of individuals, equal 
to the number of electoral votes that each state has in this election. So in Florida, there were 29 individuals that the Democrats submitted as their slate of electors. There were 29 Republicans. There were 29 Greens and Blues and Socialists and Libertarians. These days, of course, the parties choose their electors to be reflective of the nation's population, old, young, um, male, female, white, black, Hispanic, Asian. These are the individuals who, depending on who wins the state vote, are going to represent individually one of the electoral votes that were won on that day. So we look at this total 306 to 232 and must remember that in reality that meant that there were going to be throughout the country 306 individuals representing each of the electoral votes that Biden had won. Again, mostly winner take all. And there were 232 Trump electors, individuals who had been designated, 38 of them in Texas, three in Wyoming and Montana, um, you know, 29 in Florida, who were going to be Trump electors. Now, what does that mean? It means that according to <clears throat> the Electoral Count Act of 1887, an act of Congress to give more stability to the events that take place after Election Day, these individuals, the electors of the candidate who won the state, were going to travel to their state capital or to D.C. on the Monday following the second Wednesday in December. December 14th was the date um, in 2020. And at their state capitol, they would symbolically cast their electoral vote for the candidate to whom they were committed. Um, those electoral vote ballot counts would be collected, they would be sealed, and would be sent to the Senate in the care, technically, of the vice president by December the 23rd of last year. So on December the 14th, the electoral votes that were won in the general election formally were cast for the candidates who won this state. 2000, of course, was, was a very close election. In fact, it ended up coming down to Florida. And who won Florida's then just 25 electoral votes at the time? And after all of the litigation, and after the Supreme Court intervened in the Florida recount, because it found that when the Florida Supreme Court permitted the selective recounting of the vote in only a limited number of Florida counties, that ruling had violated a federally protected constitutional right, the right created under the 14th Amendment of equal protection of the laws. The Supreme Court intervened in Florida because it essentially ruled that by choosing only to recount the vote in certain counties, Florida was violating the equal protection right to have the votes recounted in every county. And because the clock was ticking towards the day when electors would have to be identified to cast electoral votes in the so-called meeting of electors, that's what we call the meeting that took place on December 14th, the Supreme Court, because it found a violation of a constitutionally protected right, 
ordered that the recount in Florida that was taking place be stopped. It found by, as a matter of law, that Florida could not recount all the votes fast enough to meet that deadline the Monday following the second Wednesday in December of 2020 and ordered that the votes be reported as they stood when the court rendered its order, meaning that George W. Bush won Florida by 527 votes, but in a winner-take-all, he won again all of Florida's then 25 electoral votes. He won the presidency, George W. Bush did, by a margin 271 for George W. Bush, 268 for Al Gore. That was a very close election. But once the court had rendered its judgment, with the day approaching for the meeting of the electors, Al Gore conceded and um, publicly acknowledged that George W. Bush had won the race. He was bitter, perhaps. Many Democrats, of course, thought that there had been a robbery or a crime committed. But all of the challenges, significant challenges, to the election came to an end. When the electors met last year, December the 14th, we saw, of course, um, this result confirmed, but if anything, we saw President Trump and, and many acting on his behalf only increase the rhetoric and, and actually create more ridiculous accusations about how the race had been rigged and stolen, not just in Florida. In order to have denied Biden of 270 electoral votes, the three states, including had to be one of them Pennsylvania, would have to have their election results nullified so that those electoral votes could be taken from Biden to bring him under 270 and thus throw the election into the House of Representatives. Now, this is where things got really um, crazy and difficult to follow. Um, as you know, many of you, I, I love to digest cable news. I've got a very boring life. Um, I've got a big supply of AA batteries and I've got, you know, the thumb equivalent of tennis elbow, flipping back and forth, back and forth. Things only got worse following November the 3rd as I subscribed to two more cable news networks, Newsmax and um, One American News, stations that make Fox News look like some bastion of liberal political discourse. They were way out there, and, and they were very fervently promoting the idea that Donald Trump had had the election stolen from him. Even Fox, five days after the election, declared Joe Biden the winner. So. The question is, how could these arguments and how could this assertion that the election was stolen had to be proved? Now, if you watched on television, if you followed the president on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, if you watched Rudy Giuliani or Sidney Powell or this lawyer from Georgia, um, Lynn Wood, or Trump's son, particularly Donald Trump Jr., you heard stories on the news or on social media that 
a particular voting machine company, Dominion, had somehow been rigged so that votes could be changed within the mechanisms of these vote counting machines. You might have heard that this company had been created by Hugo Chavez, the former Venezuelan, Venezuelan dictator who's been dead for seven years, or influenced by the Chinese. You might have heard that American votes were counted in Spain and in Germany by this dominion. None of those assertions true. In fact, this morning, subsequent to warnings being given, Dominion has sued former Trump attorney, current Trump advisor, Sidney Powell, for defamation, alleging $1.3 billion in damages to their reputation by these claims made regarding the voting machines. We heard allegations of vote counters being taken out of rooms. We heard fraud, ballots smuggled in to counting rooms at night. We saw edit videos showing boxes being put under tables. And we were told hour after hour, day after day, that these were the ways in which the election was stolen. And if you're listening to that, and only that, you know, you might be up in arms. You might think that if you're one of the 74 million people who voted for President Trump, an enormous number, except that Biden received more votes, a little less than 81 million. How could so many people have voted? Because American voting turnout in last year's election was the highest in any American presidential election since 1900. That's how. Now, how do you vindicate these assertions? How do you vindicate these accusations? How do you actually mechanically go about having these results altered or these electoral votes taken away? You go to court. And unless you have a federal constitutional claim, you go to state court. And go to court, did lawyers for President Trump. They went to court in Nevada. They went to court in Arizona. They went to court in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia. And in all of the lawsuits filed, not one attorney would sign or could sign a complaint alleging all of the fraud that we were hearing on TV and reading on social media. They couldn't say that Dominion voting machines were controlled by Venezuelans and were altered by some type of an algorithm. Um, they couldn't say that people were coming in and changing votes and adding votes because there was no proof that these things had occurred. You can, and you know, proselytize. Um, you can be a, a very uh, powerful advocate on television or on social media. You could stretch the truth you could make up things, you could lie, you could deceive to your heart's content, but any lawyer going into court cannot sign a pleading that they know to not be supported by facts, that they cannot even attempt to prove, because to do so would constitute um, mal not malpractice, but it would constitute some form of violation of lawyers' rules, the canons of ethics that lawyers must follow. So none of these assertions were made in any of the lawsuits that were filed. Overwhelmingly, 
you, you know, again, this may not have sort of seeped through. The nature of the claims were structural, involving separation of powers in states like Georgia and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, their laws say in these states that legislatures who make laws have to do certain things. Governors sign these bills into laws. You know, the Secretary of State implement those laws. They run the elections. Courts interpret whether the laws are being followed, but matters involving voting in Pennsylvania, in Georgia, in Wisconsin, had to have been determined by the legislature and the legislature alone. And the arguments that were raised in court were that governors had acted beyond their powers by mandating some certain extensions. Secretaries of state had done the same thing. And then, of course, later we heard allegations of politically motivated courts acting to ratify those acts. In reality, the courts had basically found that a legal term known as latches had applied, meaning that these facts that were brought to the court's attention after the election were known well before the election. To wait to see how the vote turns out, find that you didn't win, and then go to court afterwards to make an assertion that would have been only timely before the election, caused judges to essentially invalidate many of these claims. Attempts to go into the federal system. Um, a number of judges at the district court level appointed by President Trump basically gave no validity to these claims. Courts of appeals universally ruled against any of these claims made. And when the attorneys general led by Ken Paxson, the Attorney General of Texas, um, assisted by other Attorneys General, including Florida's Attorney General, Ashley Moody, appealed to the Supreme Court to invalidate the election results in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Georgia, claiming that those actions had harmed citizens in their states, the United States Supreme Court, nine judges, now a very decidedly conservative court with nine members so far. That may change. I'm kidding, I think. Six conservatives, three liberals, including three Trump appointees. You talk about good luck as a president. Um, seldom has a president in one term had three court seats open up for him. This appeal, or this case brought by the Texas Attorney General, joined by a bunch of others, was unanimously rejected by the United States Supreme Court in a single paragraph. All appeals exhausted as January 6th approached. But on television, of course, in social media, um, during those times when the president would, would come out and speak publicly, there was still the allegation the race had been stolen, the race had been fixed. Um, it was a rigged election. Right around Christmas, the president on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, began announcing to his followers that there was going to be a gigantic rally, stop the steal, that was going to take place on January the 6th, the date in which Congress ceremonially 
opens up the envelopes sent by every state and ratifies, approves, confirms that the electoral vote count was correct and that every state had sent the proper slate roster of electors to it. The president's saying it's going to be wild, come and join it, setting the stage for what would take place on, on January the 6th. Now, by that time, the day before, this past Tuesday, as I stand here today on January the 5th, the unbelievable had happened in Georgia. And again, something that I did not expect to occur. And that was the fact that both Raphael Warnock had defeated Kelly Loeffler and John Ossoff had defeated David Perdue. So the goal that the Democrats had set that had not been accomplished on election day, winning control of the Senate, winning a net of three Senate seats, was in fact accomplished only two months later when these two additional Democratic seats became the 49th and 50th seats, meaning that again, when Kamala Harris is inaugurated as vice president on January the 20th, Democrats will control the Senate by the narrowest of margins. And for whatever it's worth, the Democrats' goal of increasing their majority in the House of Representatives didn't come to bear. And in fact, the Democrats will have a much narrower majority in the House of Representatives, 221 to 211, three races somehow still unresolved. 221 in a House of Representatives where 218 votes is the barest majority to pass any measure in the House. So what happened? Um, on January the 6th. What has historically happened? What has historically happened, as again required by both the 12th Amendment, expounded upon by the Electoral Count Act of 1887, is that Congress gather in joint session in both the House, um, the Senate and the House gathering in the House chamber, and state by state the electoral vote count is reported. Now, the Electoral Count Act of 1887 is ambiguous in many respects because it's never been challenged in court because we've never had an election where a large number of members of Congress were going to actively and in an organized way challenge the electors submitted, not just in one state, but what was planned to have been as many as six states. This law was enacted in 1887, largely because of what had happened in an election 11 years before. Congress is always very slow, I guess. The election of 1876, when four states, Florida, of course, one of them, submitted two different slates of electors. The governor submitted one supporting the Democratic candidate. The legislature supported one supporting the Republican candidate, the, the eventual winner, Rutherford B. Hayes. And there was no mechanism in the Constitution to figure out which slate of electors was the appropriate one. So this meeting that takes place on January the 6th following an election really is limited to Congress being prepared to determine if competing slates of electors are submitted, which one is the appropriate one. Otherwise, state by state by state, Congress votes to approve the slates that were submitted after 
the meeting of electors back in December. The vice president in this process has a limited mechanical mechanistic role. Open the ballots, open the envelopes containing the roster of electors, recite the count, oversee a vote where both houses overwhelmingly approve it, and then reassert that the vote has been confirmed. The vice president not even stretching an imagination to a normal extent does not have the ability to unilaterally nullify the results of electors coming into this race. Nonetheless, the president, you know, Fox, Newsmax, America One, Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, Lynn Wood have been out there screaming fraud, the election was stolen, fake altered voting machines. None of these allegations were even raised in court proceedings. Nonetheless, managed to cause a tremendous number of Americans and a large number of Republicans and supporters of the president to believe them that there actually had been altered voting machines and ballots changed, keeping the temperature very high, showing that even though most members of Congress recognized that President Trump was going to lose on January the 6th, when the electors were confirmed by Congress, the reality, I suspect, number one, some I think were true believers. Maybe some members of Congress, you know, you heard Mo Brooks from, from Alabama recite this whole litany of, of um, unproven um, um, objections. He got all the way down the alphabet to J or M or, you know, some letter. But I think realistically, a lot of members of Congress, particularly those in the Senate who were up for re-election in 2022, and House members in very red Trump districts, and ambitious, imagine that, members of Congress. Say you were a young Republican senator, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Cruz from Texas, Hawley from Missouri, young men, Ivy League educated attorneys, clerks for United States Supreme Court justices, individuals who knew that no court had even considered any of these absurd accusations because they weren't raised in court proceedings, reckoned, I suppose, that if Donald Trump or one of his children don't seek the Republican nomination in 2024, some action, you know, futile, if you're cynical, you know, cynical action, alleging this theft on the floor of the House in a joint session of Congress might cause these senators to inherit the Trump base or perhaps have the president favor them in 2024. And of course, lots of members of Congress didn't want to incur the wrath of the president if they were up for re-election in, in 2022. We're going to see later this year a lot of gerrymandering occur in every state where the um, redesigning, um, redistricting of congressional seats is going to take place. And whether it's a red state or whether it's a blue state, legislatures every 10 years create districts in the House that are designed to be held in one by either a Republican or a Democrat. So if you are a member of the House and you are a red Republican member in a Republican-designed district, 
or a Democratic member in a Democrat-designed district, you know that the greatest threat to your winning your seat in the next election isn't in November where someone from the other party beats you. These districts were designed to be won by one party. Your greatest threat is now become a verb, being primaried, where someone in a primary from within your own party challenges you. And if you were on the wrong side of a person who is considered to be the titular head of your party or a big force within your party politics, going against him or her might mean that person supporting the member of your party challenging you in a primary. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, in 2018 won a seat in Congress covering Queens and part of the Bronx in New York by defeating in a primary a Democrat who had been more than 20 years representing that district. She had the energy to defeat him in 2020, she selected certain House races and supported some very liberal Democrats who unseated more moderate Democrats, primarying them in races that these more liberal Democrats eventually won. So there are a lot of senators who are on the ballot in, in 2022. Marco Rubio being one of them notably uh, from Florida, who might, you know, like the president's um, support. Some stories in Florida suggesting that the president's daughter, Ivanka Trump, is considering entering Florida's Republican senatorial primary in, in 2022. So as this process was beginning, and as Senator Cruz um, supported 139 members of the House, all Republicans, 139 out of 211, the roll count was alphabetically um, recited. First Alabama, then Arizona. In order to have the debate and the vote in each House regarding the um, certification of these votes, there has to be a written objection by both a member of the House and a member of uh, the Senate. It was known that maybe 150 House Republicans were going to object, but it wasn't until last week that Josh Hawley, the senator from Missouri, I think he's like 38 years old, he is now, until John Ossoff comes in, the youngest member of the Senate, educated at Stanford and at Yale. And then right after Ted Cruz announced that they were going to provide the Senate part of beginning the process of objecting to these debates. Meanwhile, down the road, adjacent to the White House, President Trump um, was conducting this speech at a rally of his supporters that had come out again for this Stop the Steal event. I watched all of it on either AON or, or Newsmax, and, and there was some very heated um, rhetoric. Um, the president's middle son, Eric Trump, and his wife, Lara Trump, who may be running for a Senate seat in North Carolina in 2020, fired up the crowd regarding a stolen election. Donald Trump Jr. said, you've got to pick sides. You're either with us or you're with them. And talked about the need to there being more aggression in expressing displeasure as to what was taking place. 
He also made a very vulgar comment about transgender athletes. I don't know where that came from, but that, that struck me as being sort of off topic. And then Rudy Giuliani came on the stage. No mascara or hair dye running down his face this time, but talked about military combat needed to take back the race. And then, of course, the president came. And again, not legally, but I think for practical purposes, fired up, incited, um, um, ranted, egged on the crowd to join him to march to the Capitol so that their voices can be heard. And you've got to take it back with power. The president said he was going to join them. He instead, of course, went back to the White House. And as the House and Senate were considering the legality of the Arizona um, electors, we saw again this surreal sight um, play out. An under guarded Capitol building. Um, many of you, of course, have now seen the images of the National Guard, dozens of them lined up to protect the Lincoln Memorial during a Black Lives Matter rally this summer. We remember, of course, how paramilitary units cleared Lafayette Square adjacent to the White House so the president can go to that church um, that had been um, damaged during rallies associated with the George Floyd killing. There was not a noticeable presence of Capitol Police, of DC Police, nor National Guardsmen outside of the Capitol building. And the result, of course, was two and a half hours of mayhem. Um, I don't know how, how sad it was, um, I felt, um, how embarrassed, how discouraged to see the United States Capitol building um, invaded by, by, by looters, by people bent on, on insurrection. I, I don't know how else to, to describe this sedition, you know, a coup it may be a little strong, but of course five people lost their lives Members of Congress were taken away to secure locations, and for several hours, things were, were very, very dicey um, until police from Virginia, Maryland, and then finally, the DC National Guard arrived to, to maintain order. Um, the president tweeted a couple of times, not very powerful, in the language of denouncing violence and telling people um, to get out. But the decision was made by both Majority Leader McConnell and Speaker Pelosi that their chambers were going to be cleaned up um, and they were going to resume the count that, that had been interrupted. Um, again, my adrenaline was flowing. I stayed up until 3.30 in the morning to yesterday morning to watch that, that final um, vote um, occur. Um, the president um, sent out a tweet that night um, which stated, and this again is in, in the midst of these people being cleared from the Capitol grounds as a curfew was being enforced at 6 p.m. on January the 6th. His statement was, these are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with love and in peace. Remember this day forever. Shortly after the president posted this tweet for the very first time, 
Twitter suspended his account, as did Facebook and Instagram. You know, there's gambling going on here. And again, the president for almost 24 hours could not connect with his 88 million followers on Twitter. Um, he took down several offensive tweets. His account was reactivated. And last night, you might have seen the video of the president in, in a very somber monotone acknowledging what had happened. And I think came the closest he ever will come to conceding, stating that there is going to be a new administration. Um, just now, I see breaking news, not, not a surprise, I suspect, that the president says he won't be attending Biden's inauguration, meaning that unlike every presidential change since 1837, the new president and his spouse will not be invited to the White House to meet the outgoing president and his spouse. They won't be traveling together to the western edge of the Capitol, where since 1981 in Ronald Reagan, the inauguration has taken place. And of course, um, President Trump will not be present on the dais to see Joe Biden um, take the oath of office. Um, calls for the 25th Amendment to be triggered to remove a president unhinged, unfit to hold office. You know, there's 13 days. What might he do in these remaining 13 days? Again, I think a bit hyperbolic. The House today, maybe, might vote out articles of impeachment, if for nothing else, to, you know, further tar Donald Trump as the only president to be impeached twice. In theory, the Senate could take it up, and if two-thirds of them, 67 out of 100, vote to convict the president, he could be removed from office. Don't expect that to happen. But again, symbolically, this course, a political action, undoubtedly, might be undertaken. But how we all feel now, maybe is not as hot as we'd felt as these things were happening on, on January the 6th. Certainly my tone has come down. But going forward, as histories are written of, of administrations and accomplishments and, and legacies, it's almost certain that this might be the one event that is going to be the first thing to be written about this presidency. I've often said that when Bill Clinton dies, whenever that day comes, hopefully a long time from now, the news stories are gonna read, William Jefferson Clinton, the 42nd president of the United States, comma, whose affair with an intern caused him to be the second president in American history to be impeached in 1988, comma, died today at the age of whatever. I wonder when that day comes for President Trump, if the first part of his obituary might not refer, not to the accomplishments, certainly in foreign policy, in the Middle East, um, in, in pre-COVID days, in the speed in which this vaccine was, was developed. Laudable accomplishments, the stock market going through the roof. Might all of that be overshadowed by the fact that from November the 3rd to the following January the 7th, he refused to acknowledge he'd lost the race, but even more so, so inflamed his supporters that there was a direct connection between the specious allegations coming from his television camp 
and the storming of the United States Capitol building, where one of our three co-equal branches of government sit. We all know that the last time the Capitol was overrun, it was overrun by the British in the War of 1812. This actually occurred in, in 1814. So on January the 20th, two weeks from Wednesday, 10 or so days from now, Joe Biden is indeed going to take the oath of office of, of President of the United States. COVID will make it a completely different type of affair of inaugurations of the past, as will the absence of the president who Biden is, is succeeding. And then Biden will preside in an environment where, unlike four years ago, when President Trump was coming into office as a Republican and his party controlled both the House and Senate, all of Congress, Biden and the Democrat will come into office where Democrats control both the House and the Senate. So when we meet again, we will um, look into the State of the Union, the issues that Joe Biden has identified as the most pressing, and how his agenda rolls out. Um, later lectures will examine the first 100 days, that's the name of the series, of Franklin Roosevelt's presidency, a very transformative time in American history. And then in April, we will examine all the president's men and women who finally ended up serving in the president's cabinet. And given the fact that Democrats controlled the Senate, I suspect that every one of President Biden's nominees are going to be confirmed, barring some um, revelation of financial impropriety or something of the same type. And we'll talk about any scandals or any allegations of misbehavior that certainly in the American political environment by April, we'll hear a lot of that. And then I promise beginning in May, we are going to leave politics behind. We are going to take a break from the present by going and examining some part of history. And we could then present lectures on a regularly scheduled basis, because at least thus far, you can't change history. So we could be more predictable. Happy New Year to everyone. I hope you either have received your vaccination or will receive it soon, and that'll make it much more um, close to us beginning to meet again live, to interact more as we look at these important events. Thank you so much and have a very nice day. Take care.